Okay, let's go. Um, there's something I want to say first. Oh, I know what it is. Um, there's a bunch of handouts on Canvas that you should take a look at. I meant to bring them with me so you can grab a copy of them, but I left, I grabbed them off later. So I'll have them on Thursday, but I might allude to some handouts. You should check, check them out just for different rules and such. Um, let's talk about these problems. So first one here, if capital G of X is equal to the integral from X to the six to natural log of X of T squared e to the T dt, find the derivative. Or in other words, find the derivative. So this is pretty much just a very straightforward application of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, which says if you take the derivative of the antiderivative, you get the function you started with. So just to kind of back up for one second, I will just point out that if we took the derivative of the integral from one to x of t squared e to the t dt, we would get x squared e to the x. No plus C, right? We took a derivative, whatever constants were there, their derivative was zero. But now we are going to be doing the chain rule version of this, which is instead of just plugging in X wherever you see a T, you're plugging in the function up here wherever you see a T. And then because it's the chain rule, we're having to multiply by the derivative of that function. So I kind of unfortunately left myself without enough room over here. I'm just gonna, we'll just cross this one out and move it to the next page. If I want to find the derivative of the integral from x to the sixth of natural log of x t squared e to the t dt, whenever you're integrating, when it's definite, it's always top first minus bottom second. So I would encourage, right? It's always the top one first. So, okay, natural log of x, I'm just plugging in the natural log of x to my function because, because of how the fundamental theorem of calculus part one works. It says the derivative of the integral is the function. But instead of plugging in x like we did here, right, and really we just plug that x in for each t, now we're plugging in the natural log of x. So I'm going to get the natural log of x squared times e to the natural log of x times the derivative of the natural log of x, which of course we're going to simplify, but it's good to be like seeing what we're doing. And then minus, and then we plug in the other thing. We're going to plug in the x to the sixth, then we're going to get x to the sixth squared times e to the x to the sixth times the derivative of x to the sixth. And then we simplify because we can. Um, I have seen this notation recently. I'm not a huge fan of it, bless you. Um, you can apparently write natural log squared of x. I personally think that's terrible. But that's fine. If you want to write it that way, no one's going to stop you. I'm gonna write it this way because like I can't help myself. E to the natural log of X is just X. Derivative of natural log of X is one over X. So those are gonna cancel, that's kind of cool. And then over here, X to the sixth squared is X to the 12th. E to the X to the sixth is still E to the X to the sixth. And the derivative of X to the sixth is six X to the fifth. I suppose if I was really going all the way, I would simplify this as the natural log of X squared minus six X to the 17th times E to the X to the sixth. That's not really the point, but it's good to be simple. To, it's good to simplify. Well, I should say the point I'm, I'm thinking of is that if you're gonna have to take a second derivative, it definitely is in your interest to simplify your first derivative as much as possible because it can be really like, right? Taking the derivative of all of this unsimplified is way more work than taking the derivative of this simplified thing. Yeah. Correct. Just like the cube root of x cubed is equal to x, because they're inverse functions and they undo each other. Cool. Question. So you don't have to actually do the f capital f of b capital f capital f of a and then differentiate the result. Not only we don't have to, we didn't. Right? Did I do that? No, I didn't. Because the theorem says it works. Okay. So specifically because, and this is, and we talked about the last time, I'll, I'll definitely say it again. If I can move a piece of paper, fine, more paper. Because that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus says, that the derivative of the integral from a constant to X of some function of T dt is equal to that same function of X. The idea being, 
So, right, so here's the theorem. And then we'll write down the chain rule version in a second. But this was because if you actually did the work, right? Let's say we knew how to anti-differentiate little f. Let's say we know that the antiderivative of little f of x is equal to capital F of x. Or in other words, the derivative of capital F of x is equal to little f of x. Right, that's what it means, antiderivative. So let's pretend like we actually went the long way. So we did the derivative of, okay, if you're integrating little f, you get the antiderivative, which is capital F of not x yet, right? We have to anti-differentiate with respect to the variable that we started with in the integrand or with what our differential is, which is f of t. But then we plug in our limits of integration. Stop me if you have questions. Okay, what do we plug in first, the x or the a? The x, always the top first. So we're gonna take the derivative eventually of capital F of x minus capital F of a. Now we know, because we just said it, that the derivative of capital F is just little f. So capital F is the antiderivative of little f. All right, let's write that down. I should really say is an antiderivative because right there are multiple antiderivatives you can differ by a constant. So let's say is an antiderivative of little f. Okay, and now here's the thing to think about. The derivative of capital F of A, well, you took your function, whatever it was, and you plugged in a number, like five. And when you plug in five, and then you get some, so if I plug in five to some function, I'm gonna get out some number that isn't changing some constant. And you take the derivative of that constant, we end up getting zero. Let me show you a hard, not a hard, a, an actual example, as opposed to this kind of um, amorphous thing that doesn't really have a lot of heft to it. Um, by the way, for those of you on Zoom, here's the attendance form, please. For those of you that came in, at some point, scan the QR code, fill out the attendance form when you have a chance. Um, but let's look at an actual example. So let's say we want to find the derivative with respect to x of the function that is the integral from pi over two to x of cosine, uh, yeah, yeah, cosine of t dt. Not a super exciting example, but it's going to work out just fine. So we work from the inside out. First, we're gonna find the integral from pi over two to x of cosine of t dt. So we're gonna get, let's see, the antiderivative of cosine is the negative sign or positive sign? Positive sign. So, but it's positive sign of t evaluated between pi over two and x. So let me plug in. We still haven't taken the derivative yet. That's why I keep writing this ddx out in front to remind myself that eventually I'm going to take the derivative. So let's see, I'm going to get sine of x minus sine of pi over 2. Plus you. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. And the derivative of sine of pi over two, it doesn't actually matter that we know that sine of pi over two is equal to one. You could say sine of seven or sine of e squared. And whatever that not variable number you're plugging in is, once you plug it in, you've got something that's constant. And the derivative of a constant is always going to be what? Zero. So this constant part here doesn't end up mattering in this process because when you plug it in, the take the derivative zero. So let me point out, here's what we're doing. We're taking the antiderivative of this function. We're replacing T with X. And then we're taking the derivative of that function and get you right back where you started. The only difference is instead of saying cosine of T, now we're saying cosine of X. 
problem from global to future, but it's how does it feel when A was not a constant? A is a constant. A is a constant. Yes, it was. No, it was X. Whoa, sure, sure, sure. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. That's fine. Sure. Yeah, we'll get there in a second. Yeah, UK. Fair enough. This is a totally different problem. No, well, you would do the, you would do, you would do everything except for taking the derivative at the end. But typically, in that situation, you have what's called a definite integral, where both the bottom and the top are both constants, not a variable, right? And then you just plug in and you evaluate and get a number. Cool. Um, let's go with this because I think it's, I think it's worth doing the rest of. This. So I will also point out. Let's do an example first. Let me think of an example real quick. Let's say we wanted to find the derivative of the integral from, sure, I'm just going to make up numbers, five to, yeah, why not, x cubed of something not too terrible to anti. Oh, yeah, let's go with secant squared. Let's go secant squared of t dt. All right, same idea. We're going to first find the antiderivative of secant squared and then plug in the limits of integration. And luckily, secant squared is a function we know how to anti-differentiate. Or in other words, we know a function whose derivative is secant squared. And it is, drum roll please, tangent of t. We still have to plug in the five and the x cubed. Okay, so we do it. We plug in tangent of, oh, sorry, I should start with the derivative. Derivative of tangent of x cubed minus tangent of five. I have no idea what tangent of five is. You could plug it into a calculator. It's something terrible. It's probably around, I don't know, negative one. If you think, if you're talking radians, right? Five radians, not quite a whole revolution. So you're somewhere over in quadrant four and tangents, I don't know, it's probably close to. 7 pi over 4, right? That's 21-ish over 4. That's like 5. So this is maybe close to 1, negative 1. I don't care. It's derivative of 0. It's constant. Tangent of 5 is a constant. The derivative of this is not secant square root of 5. Or it is, but then you have to multiply by the derivative of 5, which is oh, you just get 0. So constants, their derivative is always, always, always 0. Yeah. When you want to secant square to cancel, um, you found the antiderivative. Correct. Right? So Correct. Correct. That allow you to get rid of the d over dx. So, so, so let me. So let's let's talk about instructions here. So when I write this whole list of instructions here, there are two instructions. This inner instruction, this integral symbol, with the dt along with it. This instruction says anti differentiate with respect to the variable t, which we have done. We did the anti derivative. We got tangent of t, and then we plugged in the limits of integration. But this other instruction out in front, which we haven't done yet, this says differentiate or take the derivative. We still have to do that. But we couldn't do it until we plugged in the x things. So now that we've plugged in x cubed in this particular case, now we are able to go ahead and take the derivative of this expression. So we know that derivative tangent of x is secant squared of x. And now the chain rule tells us that the derivative of tangent of some stuff is going to be secant squared of that stuff. And what do I have to multiply by? You guys remember the derivative of the stuff. Minus zero. Okay. So, so if one of the endpoints is a variable, we take the derivative after applying the FTC part two. Well, so here's the point, is you don't have to do any of this garbage work that I just did. So all of this work, all of these, you know, one, two, three, four steps here, you get to do it in one step because the fundamental theorem of calculus part one says we can always do this. Because the problem is, what do you do when you're asked to find the derivative of the integral from one to x to the fourth of e to the t squared dt. I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't integrate that because you can't. I can't. No one can. This is a function that does not have an elementary function as an antiderivative. Elementary function just means 
combinations of things we know like sine, cosine, trig function, e to the x, natural log of x, powers of x, stuff like that. There is no combination of functions that is the antiderivative of e to the t squared. But the point is, the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, the chain rule version of it, chain rule version, says that if you're taking the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a constant to some other function of x of f of t dt, instead of just plugging in x and getting f of x in the basic version of it, you plug in g of x, and then you multiply by the derivative of the inside stuff. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to say, oh, that's going to be e to the x to the fourth squared times the derivative of x to the fourth, which is 4x cubed. And then I would simplify that and write it as e to the x to the fourth squared is x to the eighth times 4x cubed. And there is no other way to do this problem. You have to be able to just appeal to the theorem because there isn't any other way to attack it. So back to the, so back, just to point out, back to this question here, if you wanted to do this a short way, you would just plug in X cubed and get secant squared of X cubed and then multiply by the derivative of X cubed, which is three X squared. And not only can you do it this way, the implication is that you're encouraged and wanted to do it this way, right? No one is asking you this question unless they specifically say do it the long way, meaning do it the long way. They want you to just use the theorem. So, and no, it's, it's so, it's so, 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 let's answer that question with a question. What if I wanted to find the derivative of the integral from, I don't know, x to the seventh of, or sorry, from x to the seventh to three of t over t squared plus one dt. Right, you, so you can write the additional step of saying it's equal, you don't, so I'm gonna skip this step, but you could say it's gonna be equal to the derivative of the negative of the integral from three to x to the seventh of t over t squared plus one. But you don't need to write that step. You can skip this step, in my opinion, and just be like, oh, well, I'm this thing here, same rule. So I know there's going to be a negative out in front. And then I plug in my x to the seventh. I plugged it in wherever I saw a t. And then I have to use the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of x to the seventh. Yes, we could simplify this. No, we're not going. Okay, so now to get at the question that from the beginning or something like it, how do you deal with something like this? The derivative from e to the 2x to, I don't know, sine of x of t cubed cosine of t. So, I'm oh, sorry, you can't really say that very well. The idea here is really just to use another rule of integrals, which is that if you have an integral from one place to another place, you can break it up anywhere you like. This is the way I think about it. So graphically, here's what I'm thinking of. Here's the rule I'm imagining. If I want to find the area under the curve f of x from y from x equals a to b. And this is on that rule sheet that I handed out last time. It's on Canvas as well. You can break this up anywhere you want. And yes, I do mean anywhere, although I'm going to draw it in a place that looks visually appealing. But I will point out the C I'm breaking it up at doesn't actually have to be between A and B. It makes more sense at first if you think about it that way, but you do not have to do it that way. I am definitely saying that 100%. I'll show you. Well, in fact, we can talk about it in just a minute. So let's. Hold on, hold on a moment. So what we're saying here is you have this right side here in red and you have this left side here in blue. And what we're saying is we can write this integral as the integral from A to C of f of x dx plus the integral from C to B 
of f of x dx. So we can do that up here as well and say, well, I'm going to pick a point, quote, in between them, although it doesn't even have to be in between them, and say, okay, I'm going to write this integral as, well, first, let's just go down here, the derivative of the integral from, let's see, e to the 2x to 0 is the point I'm going to pick that's quote unquote in the middle of those two functions, plus the integral from 0 to sine of x. And then furthermore, I'm going to rewrite this one flipped with a minus sign. So this is really minus the integral from 0 to e to the 2x t cubed cosine t dt. And so what I've really got here is the derivative of, I'm going to change the order. I'm going to write this one first. The integral from 0 to sine x of t cubed cosine t dt minus the integral from 0 to e to the 2x t cubed cosine t dt. Or in other words, when you do this and you've got a function on the top and the bottom, you just apply the chain rule type of rule and you just do the top first minus the bottom second, like you normally would. Know. So hold on one second. Just going to cut to the chase here and then I'm happy to take all the questions. So for this first one, the derivative of the integral from zero to sine of this function, I'm just going to plug in sine and get sine of x quantity cubed times cosine of sine of x times the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x, minus, I'm gonna do the same deal here, I'm gonna plug in e to the 2x and get e to the 2x cubed times cosine of e to the 2x times the derivative of e to the 2x, which requires its own chain rule. The derivative of e to the 2x is e to the 2x times two. Questions, you see? No, you can use anything you want. I suppose technically you shouldn't use something where the function is undefined. Like if this function were undefined somewhere, which it's not, but other functions could be, technically you shouldn't be breaking it up somewhere where the function is undefined, but it's not really a big word. So I had a question for the function, but before I ask that, can you clarify how it could see not be in the middle? Well, sure. It requires another rule, that's fine. So let's say we do this instead. So I'm going to say the same thing. The integral from a to b of f of, oh, can you see that? Yeah. f of x dx is equal to the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. But the integral from c to b is out of order, right? c to b isn't left to right the way I've drawn this. So what we would normally do is we would change this um, one second then. Um, and we would say this is the integral from a to c of f of x dx minus the integral from b to c of f of x dx. And then graphically, it totally makes sense. You're saying this area from a to b is the same as the total area from a to c minus the area from b to c, which it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can totally think of you can totally think of this, right? The integral from zero to sine is kind of all the area, and then you're subtracting off the area from zero to e to the two x to get just the area from e to the two x to sine. So, long story short, you can always break up an integral at any point in the middle. My brain still says in the middle when I do it, even though it's not necessarily in the middle. But if you want to break this up, right, you can say I'm going to go from e to the two x to wherever I want, and then from that same wherever I want to the sign of x. Yeah. Then you have a function at the bottom down and also a function at the top down. And let's say you have a function that was really hard to integrate. Instead of doing all of this, could you just call that function and then activate it as h capital of x? Sure. And if you do all everything else, it should give us the same result, right? Can you do h yeah. capital of g of x minus h capital of x? Totally right. You could, you could totally call this. If you think of, if you call the Antiderivative is say capital F of T, then you could totally write this as the derivative of capital F of sine of X. You can't see what I'm writing at all. Sorry. 
minus the derivative of capital F of e to the 2x. And then you would say, oh, well, the derivative is F prime, which is exactly this function here with sine of X plugged in times the derivative of cosine of X minus F prime, which is exactly that function there, plug in e to the 2X times e to the 2X times two. So yes, that's exactly why it's working the way it's working. Um, did I actually write down the final term factor for two? I did, okay, cool. So just a reminder, there's the chain rule version of it right there. Somebody asked why it was a, why we flip the sign. And the reason we flip the sign is because the e to the two x is in the bottom limit of integration. So we wrote it like this, and then to get it in the more normal or standard order of integration, we changed the order, but then that changes the sign. Um, there is a reason for that that I can get into if you would like, but I do not have to. We prefer the, yeah, so the question is, so the variable should be at the top. And the answer is, it, yes, if we want to think about it in the standard way, but you can, you don't have to actually write, rewrite it. You can just be like, oh, I know there's going to be a negative sign. So back when we were doing, sorry, one second here. Back when we were looking at, first, back when we were looking at this example here, we could have just skipped straight to this and say, well, we know that since the X to the seventh is in the bottom limit of integration, we're gonna get a negative sign and then just apply the rule. Or you can go through the extra step of switching the order so that the three is at the bottom, the X to the seventh is at the top, and then it changes the sign. Either way is fine. Okay, yeah. That is exactly it. That is what the fundamental theorem of calculus part one says emphatically that the derivative of the antiderivative gets you back to where you started. That is really the whole gist of it. And it seems kind of, when you say it that way, not that big a deal, right? Like you're like, well, yeah, of course, the derivative and the antiderivative should undo each other, but it's the whole basis for what we're doing with the rest of this. So it's a big deal. It's really important that we recognize and really feel in our souls that the derivative undoes what the antiderivative does. Because while we are great or should be great at differentiating functions at this point, anti-differentiating is not so algorithmic, right? If you have a function, you want to differentiate it. You look at the function, you're like, well, okay, I can do the product rule, the chain rule, the quotient rule, whatever rule, right? We just throw the rules that we know at it and eventually it'll work. Right? There's not really a function you could get presented with that you could not anti sorry, could not differentiate with enough time and patience. On the other hand, there are plenty of functions that are impossible to anti-differentiate. And so it's really important that we recognize that whatever the antiderivative might do, the derivative of that result is going to undo what we just maybe weren't able to actually do, which is what this whole thing is saying right here. Yeah. There are rules in place, but there are some functions that don't, in fact, I will say the majority of functions that exist are not anti-differentiable. Now, there are certainly a lot of functions. It's kind, of, it's kind of like talking about the integers versus the real numbers. There's a lot of integers, right? An infinite number of them, but there are vastly more real numbers. So even though there's plenty of examples of functions that we can integrate nicely and have to differentiate and all the stuff, there are way, 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 way more of them that are not possible. Some very common examples are like, sine of x squared, e to the x squared, cosine of x squared, sine of x cubed, all those functions, there is no nice function that has an antiderivative. Now, if you ever kind of try to plug them into like Wolfram Alpha or whatever people are using these days to try and integrate things, um, some of them are very standard. It'll be like, oh, this is i of x, where we have defined i of x to be the integral from zero to x of this e to the t squared or whatever. So like, sometimes we define these functions in terms of integrals because we like them and they're important in statistics. Yeah. <laughs> sure. If you leave the outside, I was interested to know why is it that we can't have normal rules for integration that would look as messy as the rules? What do you mean by normal rules? Right. Because there is a specific rebates made by the principle. But that, that is not true with integration. Is it so, 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 so there's a difference between integrability. There's a difference between integrability and a function having a nice antiderivative. Let's say antiderivative. Sure. That well, because the, the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. 
but there's there i mean there are lots of functions that we just that do not fit into the rules because the rules you're it's a problem you're trying to work backwards to something that might not really be there whereas with differentiation i mean at least in my head i'm thinking of differentiation is kind of working forward like you're you're pushing problem forward or i think differentiation you're trying to back up to something before that you know you could differentiate to get there so it is fundamentally a differentiation is fundamentally prior to anti differentiation I don't know if I could say that necessarily, but that's how, that, at least in my head, that's how I think of it, yes. Yeah, I think you have to differentiate before you really anti-differentiate. Um, okay, there was, another, there was another question on this beginning page that we, so the other question here that we had on this page, I think, yeah, was just to find this definite integral. The integral from zero to two of three e to the three x. The point being to use the second more often used part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is that we're going to find the area under this curve or the integral here by anti-differentiating 3e e to the 3x and then substituting in the limits of integration. So the question here is what function has a derivative that's 3e e to the 3x? And the answer, which we'll eventually do via u substitution, but for now we can hopefully see that this function's antiderivative is just e to the 3x evaluated between 0 and 2. So if you're not sure, ask yourself, what's the derivative of e to the 3x? Well, the derivative of e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, which is exactly that. You work it out. So we can't work it out yet until we have u substitution as a process. But the, the way we could check at this juncture is to say, oh, I definitely can see that the derivative of e to the 3x is e to the 3x times the derivative of 3x, which is just e to the 3x times 3. So that, But that's an important skill to have. If you can recognize that the derivative of something is something else, then the antiderivative of that something else is the thing you took the derivative of. So, I didn't really use a process here, although we will develop it eventually to find the antiderivative of three e to the three x. I just remembered that I know the derivative of e to the three x gets you an extra multiple of three. The rest of this problem is just plugging stuff in. So plugging in two, we get e to the three times two minus e to the three times zero, which we should definitely simplify as e to the six minus one. And you should not do anything else with this. You should not plug it into a calculator and get a decimal approximation. One, because e to the six is big, but two, nobody's asking for that. Nobody wants your decimal approximation. They want your actual exact precise answer, which is this. That's why we write square root of two and not 1.4. The square root of two is the exact number. 1.4 is the approximation. Um, so now which direction to go in here? All right, sure. A couple rules and then some areas. Yeah. So I think we covered most of the rules I wanted to cover, except for one of them, which is the following. Um, let's find the integral from negative two to two of x cubed dx. So if we find this, there's a couple of ways to go here. I'm gonna break it up at zero, although you can break it up anyway. But I wanna break it up at zero specifically because something interesting happens. So if we calculate this right-hand one here, that's going to equal, well, the antiderivative of x to the third is x to the fourth over four from zero to two, which ends up being two to the fourth over four minus zero to the fourth over four. Two to the fourth is 16. 16 divided by four is four. I'll, just a caution in general. Often when you plug in zero, you get zero, but you don't always. There are plenty of functions that when you plug in zero, you don't get zero, like e to the x, for example. So just don't get into the habit of saying, oh, zero is zero. You have to actually think about, if I plug in zero, what happens? Do I get zeros? A lot of the time you will, but not all the time. Also, cosine of zero, not equal to zero, it's equal to one. So just, just a word of warning. This other side here, though, is going to be x to the fourth over four from negative two to zero. I plug in the top part first, I get zero. Minus I plug in the bottom part second, I get negative two to the fourth over four, 
And that's going to be 0 minus 16 over 4, which is negative 4. And so when I add these two together, negative 4 plus 4 is going to be 0. And what's interesting here is graphically, we can really see that these regions have areas that cancel each other out. The function looks, if I graph it decently well, I'll try my best here, it's never my best. This function looks kind of like this. Ah, it's like it's flatter. And what we're essentially saying is over here, this area is four. And over here, this area below the x-axis is negative four. And when we add them together, they cancel each other out. And the reason this works is because x cubed is an odd function on an interval that goes from a negative value to the corresponding positive value. So more generally, here's a rule that's always true. If f of x is an odd function, then the integral from negative a to a of f of x dx is equal to zero. This fact comes up quite often. Yeah. Well, I don't. So, so, so certainly any just odd power of x, like x to the fifth, x to the seventh, x to the 1001, all those are odd functions because they meet the criteria, but you know what else is odd? Sine, tangent, other things. <laughs> um, I'm like, uh, x cubed plus x, x times cosine of x, right? There are lots of odd functions. So how do you check to see if something is odd? f of x is odd if f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. That's how you check to see if a function is odd, which makes sense if you think about this function over here, right? For, oh gosh, come on. For x cubed, you have the point like 2 comma 8 and negative 2 comma negative 8. Sorry, that was terrible there. Um, f of 2 is 8. And f of negative 2 is negative f of 2, which is negative 8. Totally works. So, for example, you could see someone ask something that looks really impossible because it is. Someone could ask you something like, what's the, I think of a good example, the integral from negative pi to pi of sure, x squared times, tangent is a bad choice, James. Let's go sine of x over x to the six plus one. This function might be anti-differentiable. There might be a way of finding it, but we don't want to. It's terrible if it is. But the point is, if you see something like this, it's a clue. This specifically, these limits of integration, that's a clue. That's a clue that maybe this function is odd and maybe this integral is equal to zero because the positive area and the negative area are canceling each other out. So how do we check? We have to check that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. Something nice about trig functions is every trig function is either odd or even on its own. The only even ones are cosine and its reciprocal secant. So cosine, if you think about it, has the even symmetry, right? It's got the, like, it's, it's the reflective across the y-axis, and so is secant. And the other four, sine, see, uh, sine, tangent, see, well, holy, sh sine, tangent, cosecant, cotangent, those four are odd functions, which means that specifically sine of negative x is equal to negative sine of x because sine is odd. So if I want to check that this whole function's odd, I'm checking to see that f of x equal to x squared times sine of x over x to the six plus one. Is this odd? I'm looking at f of negative x. Okay, that's negative x quantity squared times sine of negative x over x, sorry, negative x to the six plus one. And then I'm simplifying. Negative x quantity squared is x squared. 
sine of negative x is negative sine of x. I have to use the fact that I know sine is an odd function to be able to do the problem. Negative x to the sixth is just x to the sixth because that's an even power. And then factoring out the negative sign, the negative one that is a S-I-G-N, I hate that sine and sine sound the same. Factoring out the negative one, I've got x squared times sine of x over x to the sixth plus one, which is exactly f, sorry, negative f of x, which shows it's odd. And then since the function's odd, we can say, great, this integral has to be zero because the positive areas and the negative areas are gonna to totally cancel each other out. Plugging it in is usually the easiest way. I mean, if you can graph it really fast, sure, you can look at the graphing symmetry, but it's not, I mean, if you're graphing by hand, it's not easier to do that than to do this. No, so, so here, so, okay, there's a couple of small rules I will tell you, and I just think of them as how, how you multiply powers together. So here are some rules if you like to see if a function is odd or even, if you already know some of the components are odd or even. So let me ask you, if you multiply an odd function by an even function, what do you get? An odd function. You multiply an odd function times an odd function, what do you get? An even function. If you multiply an even function by an even function, what do you get? Even, and this is always true. So if you have a function, so if f of x is odd and g of x is even, then f of x times f of x is even, or an odd times an odd is even. f of x times g of x is odd, and odd times an even is odd, and g of x times g of x is even. Sorry, I'm being lazy and not using like a different odd or even function. What I'm really saying here is some odd function times some other odd function is even. And some even function times some other even function is even. And some odd function times some even function is odd. Always true. So if you're so so basically you could have looked back at this example, I suppose, and said, okay, well, if I know that sine of x is odd, and I know that x squared is an even function, I know that one over x to the six plus one is also an even function, which might be a little bit of a stretch, but you can probably get there. Then multiplying all of them together gives you an odd function at the end. But it's probably just easier to do the thing I did, to be honest. Okay. So, yeah, that was the only other, that was the other kind of neat rule I wanted to talk about. Um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, not you. Yeah, so we should start moving into actually finding area. Um, So something to remember, this antiderivative here from, no, not from, let's say the antiderivative of f of x dx, very general. This is an antiderivative, also called a indefinite integral. And the answer you're looking for is a function. typically of the variable you're dealing with. So in this case, a function of x. For example, if I was gonna find the antiderivative of two e to the two x plus x to the fourth, the answer is gonna be, well, the antiderivative of two e to the two x is e to the two x, and the antiderivative of x to the fourth is x to the fifth over five. And then since, a very, since it's an antiderivative as a function, we slap on a plus C because we could actually add any constant we want. So if it's an indefinite integral, AKA an antiderivative, your answer is a function, so we need a plus C. On the other hand, if you're finding a definite integral, where you have limits of integration that are constants, this is a 
definite integral because we have those limits of integration. We use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two to calculate it typically by anti-differentiating and plugging in the endpoints. But it's very, very important to recognize that here, the answer we're going to be getting is a number. It might be zero. It might be pi. It could be anything, right? It could be e to the six minus one, right? There's lots of different answers. But the big distinction between definite integrals and indefinite integrals is when you're finding an indefinite integral, you're finding a function of x. When you're finding a definite integral, you're finding the area under the curve or the net area above the x-axis under the curve, the more specific we get, or whatever they mean. Um, so for example, here, we could be asked to find, say, like the antiderivative or so the integral from, I don't know, negative one to four of 3x plus seven. And that's however much area is under this curve between negative one and four. And the way we calculate this is by anti-differentiating that integrand, that function. I'm gonna get three x squared over two plus seven x. And then we're gonna plug in our limit of integration. Always top first, always bottom second. So I'm gonna plug in four. I'm going to get three times four squared over two plus seven times four minus plug in negative one. Three times negative one squared is just three over two. And then seven times negative one is negative seven. And then we would simplify it if we had time, but we're not. Ah, fine. We can three, 16 over two is eight. You're going to get 24 plus 28 minus three halves. Plus seven, make sure you distribute that minus sign. So let's see, 24 plus 28 is 52 plus seven, 59 minus three halves. So you're getting 57 and a half. Sure, let's go decimal, 57.5. Again, I don't so much care about, like really if I was taking a test, I would probably stop like here. If I had more time later, I'd come back and do the rest. But the point here is that the answer is a number, not a function. Um, I got a minute. Okay, let's do one more because it's fun. How about this integral? The integral from zero to six of two times the square root of 36 minus x squared. We will learn how to integrate this function or anti-differentiate this function and use the fundamental theorem calculus on it, but not yet. I, you don't know yet how to, you probably don't know yet how to anti-differentiate this function. You might, I don't know, maybe you'll have some crazy stuff. But at this point, here's what we're supposed to do. So to factor out the two, because almost, almost, not always, always, but almost always, it is usually to your benefit, if you've got a constant multiple, just pull it out in front, make life easier. And then to use geometry. This y equal to the square root of 36 minus x squared might be more easily recognized if I square both sides and add x squared to the left. What kind of graph is that? It's a circle. What kind of graph is this? Top half of a circle. So here's what we've got. We've got the top half of a circle of radius 6. And we are integrating or finding the area under this curve from x equals zero to x equals six. So we are finding all of this shaded area. Great. I know how to find the area of a circle. I certainly know how to find the area of one quarter of a circle. So this is going to end up equaling two times one quarter of pi times my radius squared because it's one quarter of a circle. And that's gonna be one half times 36 pi, which is 18 pi. Great, done. Bye. Right. And I should stop because it's 201. You're welcome. So just in general, if you're asked to find some area and it doesn't look like something you know how to do yet, it might be an indication that it's some sort of geometrical shape that you already know how to calculate the area of. 
Usually that's going to be a triangle or a rectangle or a circle at this point. There's not a lot of options, but those are the typical options. All right, I'll see you all Wednesday.